Um, you did. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Just a few minutes, no worry. <laughs> okay, I'll share again. There. Okay, so um, this one is from the ironing department at a factory. And today, obviously, these women are replaced with robots. It was about doing the same thing over and over again. And the challenge here was to make the flows as effective as possible and to standardize uh, processes. Um, yep. Lavas, por favor, mi vida. Ya necesito ir a recién a hacer esto. Uy, ¿qué salí? ¿Cómo es the audience silent, the microphones. Ajá. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So you can mute yourselves if if you are uh, if you have noise in the background, if you have people in the background. I thought it was a question coming in actually, but yeah, I'll continue. Um, the women on this picture, they didn't have a say in how things should be done, and it was all carefully thought about out by a few men probably in the top, and they were just doing what they were told. Uh, so um, the future of work will look entirely different. Have you, have you thought about that? This, this is actually where we almost are today. Uh, and, and this was just, this slide is two years old. And when I look at it today and I see what I uh, wrote two years ago, many of these things has already come true. Uh, it's amazing. You know, artificial intelligence and robotics um, will ultimately create more work, not less. And it, it will not be a shortage of jobs, but the shortage will be in the right skills. So if we don't, unlearn and relearn and reskill uh, people, uh, there will be a shortage of, of skilled talents to fill the jobs available. Uh, also, the majority of the workforce will freelance by 2027. Actually, I believe that it will be maybe earlier than that, looking at today's um, uh, society and the way things have developed. And also remote work becomes the norm, and this is already a reality, right? Um, new geographic freedom for all people. They can uh, work from where they live, etc., and they can live anywhere in the world. So in this complex reality that we are facing, um, we have to move from viewing the organization as a machine that can be controlled and managed to viewing it as a social system because people are not cogs in a machinery. They have feelings, dreams, challenges, and thoughts, and cannot be controlled. People are not robots. They are complex adaptive systems that work from intrinsic motivation. And that means that we need to stop to see people as resources and view them as the living organisms that they are, who we need to treat differently to work optimally, because everybody has different basic needs and are, um, it's a very diverse uh, workforce out there no standardization or boxing people with labels or grades anymore, just skills to understand better what makes each person tick. And to create this well-functioning social system is a very complex task and, and we need to use a lot more experimentation and trial and error for it to work. And there are no recipes for success here. And agile is definitely not the silver bullet who will solve it all. Uh, so what do you need to do to make a person function optimally? Well, you need to care about basic psychological needs, and these are different for all people. So I have written three books about the topics of agile HR, agile leadership, and human motivation at work. And this is the first book that came out in 2017. And the second book is a picture book with 220 illustrations that complement the message from the first book. The, uh, and uh, I can make this book available for anybody who is in this uh, conference talk, uh, free for download, if you um, contact me after uh, this conference. And the last book came out in September 2020, and it's very, it's actually not really available yet uh, to buy. Um, we have a few copies printed. 
but it's available in a flip, flip book format. It's a co-creation project uh, with 35 Agile people around the world where we have each written about one Agile people principle. I, I wanted to start by giving a view of the problems with traditional leadership and traditional HR. Um, and the first problem is this, we, we believe that we can control reality and make a perfect plan, but reality looks very different. And we know this, especially now um, after the pandemic has hit, that we don't know what will happen. It, it, it's not like we have a crystal ball that we can look into and see what's going to happen in uh, the next month or uh, even the next week. So the problem is that the world is not predictable anymore and we need feedback regularly from reality to make the right choices along the way. Uh, so instead of making a perfect plan that we already know before it starts will not happen, you could say that in Agile you accept reality as it is and adapt to it. Um, the problem is that we are focusing too much on shareholder value when we should focus first on the customer value and the employee satisfaction. Happy employees serve customers and happy customers will lay the foundation for profitable organizations that can deliver value to the shareholders. But the value to the shareholders is a consequence of the value creation happening between employees and customers. So um, we need profit to survive as a company, but that's not the reason why we run the company. The reason is to create value for some customers. So this is very beautifully expressed by Frederick Leloux in this quote, profit is like the air we breathe. We need air to live, but we don't live to breathe. Another problem is that our organizational system is not making it easy for us to perform. Instead, the system is limiting us, putting obstacles in the way for great performance and uh, letting people be themselves and perform from their abilities. Think about it. You know, a good system can make a mediocre person fantastic and a bad system can make a high performer perform really bad. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit also about control because the definition here is the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. And in business terms, it means controlling people or controlling the future. And this is what we call the grand illusion. People can and must be managed and the future is predictable and manageable. This is what... Um, managers think, but it's just an illusion. We have a lot of budget problems uh, as well. Uh, the budget process, anybody who has engaged in that knows that it's an extremely time consuming process. Uh, the assumptions that we make in that process uh, are quickly outdated and it stimulates a lot of unethical behaviors in the organization, competition and um, you know, brown nosing, um, different activities to gain advantages before others, etc. So politics, it creates illusions of control, but we all know there is no control. Decisions are made too early and often too high up in the organization. It guarantees that we have planned costs, but it doesn't guarantee that we have the planned revenues. And it could pre prevent other value adding activities that we could engage in if we didn't have the fixed budget. And linked to that budget are often then these fixed performance targets, um, annual goals uh, and ratings uh, that we put onto people. Um, and the problem with the traditional performance ratings are very well known as well. A uh, year is much too long when the organizational reality changes quickly. Um, there is no proactivity in this process. We are always focusing on judging the history, not uh, looking to improve for the future. And does the boss really know best? Well, there might be other people who knows better how I have performed than, than the boss. And it's also connected to salary and rewards and bonuses, which leads to sandbagging and lower set goals. 
and the sub-optimizing effects uh, breed competition. And what we need is really cooperative and collaborative behaviors and co-creation in projects. So we are focusing on all the wrong things um, and just uh, results count, not the good behaviors, which could form a, a good, profitable, uh, healthy company in the longer perspective. Employee engagement um, is also another problem that we have. Um, the ma vast majority of workplaces are not great places to work, very far from it. So um, the managers is another problem. Managers are feeling a lack of psychological safety in in agile transformation programs. What happens to me in my role, they may uh, think. What will become of me when everybody seems to be able to lead themselves and don't need to be managed anymore? And this problem needs to be taken very seriously and can potentially ruin the whole change initiative. Uh, the skills that took managers to the position they are in today are often not the skills that are needed to lead in a complex world. And for an agile organization, it's more about removing impediments for people to be able to perform than managing and making decisions. Although sometimes the organization needs someone to make tough decisions when the teams cannot do it themselves. So how do managers go from traditional high power and status to servant and transformational leadership. We need to make it possible for leaders to change in the system by changing the environment. And we need to inspire leaders to find the intrinsic motivation to do that and to help them attain an agile mindset. But these are two conflicting goals as it's only the leaders who can change organizational structures that will make it possible for increased business agility to happen. And to do that, they need the mindset, but they can only get the mindset by having the right structures and the environment. So it's a catch 22 dilemma here. And this is why managers don't change in organizations. But what should we do instead? You know, what shall we do about all these problems? People ask me all the time, and I actually have some ideas. And one of these ideas has to do with a new role that leaders and HR need to take for the future of work. And that's the agile people coach or agile people leader role. So the agile people leader is a new role that more and more people discover. And we created this new role because we believe it will be crucial for HR and leaders to change their role uh, fundamentally to support their organizations and the people to be able to increase agility in all corners of the company. So um, the Agile People Coach is a role where you use many competences and become more T-shaped depending on where you come from. And you can come from HR or leadership, or maybe you have been an Agile Coach in the past. What's the difference then between an Agile Coach versus an Agile People Coach? Well, an Agile People Coach has much more focus on the people, whereas an Agile Coach uh, mainly uh, focus on the processes and the tools like Scrum and Kanban boards and other methods and models. So uh, an Agile people coach needs to have deep people skills. I have this um, table where I, um, I, uh, I kind of, um, we move from something to something, but it's not that we let go of the old stuff we just balance it in a better way. So instead of focusing mainly on team coaching and coordination of teams for the agile coach, they focus also more on individual team and or enterprise coaching. And instead of only having deep process skills, they also have deep people skills. And instead of working mainly in software development and IT and tech related um, uh, departments, they also, could work in any business function and between business uh, functions. Um, in the past, they have been most commonly active in industries related to tech and digital development. And um, an agile people coach instead can have experience from a variety of different industries. The more, the better, because then we get a, a more full picture 
of the world and what different industries there are. The background is uh, mainly for an agile coach uh, in IT or project management of IT projects when the background of of an agile people coach could be in any business uh, function. It could be HR, legal, finance, marketing, or any other um, product domain in the company. No formal or, uh, power or position to, yeah, the agile people coach could actually have formal power uh, or a position um, because they may come from a formal leader role and they are moving gradually into a more coaching kind of servant leadership. Um, no or little leadership or HR experience to um, experience from leading people or supporting leaders leading people will be necessary for an agile people coach. So if we look at H agile HR now, we turn to the HR function and look at that and what would that look like? Um, then we see a big change uh, how uh, that the whole HR departments are transforming into something else. Um, so it's in, instead of implementing controls and standards and drive execution and check compliance to HR processes, it's rather facilitation and improving organizational agility that should be on the agenda for uh, the future HR function. And it changes HR's mission and focus totally because driving agility means driving programs which create different things, innovation, collaboration, and speed. Um, I believe that HR should be leading the change because they've been sitting in the back seat for too long. And um, why is that? Because all these deep processes in the organizations um, come from HR uh, or finance mainly. Uh, it's, about, it's about performance management, organizational development, leadership development. Uh, it's about talent acquisition, performance management, and, and you know all these deep processes that affects everybody and stifles the organization if we don't do them in new and different way. And that's why HR has this possibility to go first and start to experiment on themselves and then spread these values and tools and models and uh, the principles to the rest of the organization by working together with them, not delivering to the organization, but instead working together with the organization uh, to help them to succeed and uh, support them to deliver and remove uh, um, any obstacles in their way. Um, job descriptions are boxes for standing on, not living in. So this is one area of, of HR that shifts uh, totally when we move to agile HR, because it's not about labeling people anymore, putting them in boxes and um, limiting them by uh, doing very detailed job descriptions, for example. Instead, we can we can express expectations on people. What do we expect from you in this role and not go into the exact how they should be doing that, but giving them, them the freedom to choose the how and more manage the why. Um, T-shaped competence uh, is about spanning boundaries on an individual level. And in Agile, we talk about this a lot. Uh, you need to have both breadth and depth. You can also call them generalized specialists or, gen or specialized generalists. And this creates a lot of flexibility in the organization for individuals, teams, and the whole organization. Um, it makes competency shifts possible and minimizes the risk for bottlenecks in competence and a much better adaptability for uh, changing organizational competence requirements. We don't have to fire people because we don't need their job role anymore because they can always do something else if they are T-shaped. So what does this move look like from being an HR professional of any sort to becoming an agile people coach? Well, instead of only having extensive HR process competence, um, an Agile people coach also needs to understand complex systems, which is a skill that most HR people don't have. 
instead of deep skills in some HR specialist area, they need deeper general people skills like psychology, sociology, relationships, etc. And instead of having no formal power to lead the transformation, uh, I think definitely that they could be able to lead that transformation. Now my computer is flickering awfully a lot. Did my uh, screen share stop? Did it? Yeah. <laughs> That's what happens yes. sometime. Okay, so I'm sharing again. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Um, more trust and influence to transform uh, for an HR person. Instead of being stuck in certain roles as an HR person, uh, this uh, agile people coach needs the flexibility to wear different hats depending on the need of, of the specific organization. Instead of one size fits all training and solutions, solutions are tailored towards unique local needs. And instead of developing and delivering solutions to the business, it's about developing solutions together with the business. And instead of mainly supporting the managers, it's about supporting everybody, all the people. Uh, and instead of having a slightly parental view sometimes, it's about trusting and treating employees as adults. Instead of focusing on individual performance, it's about enabling system performance. And instead of expecting answers, uh, they need to develop their listening and observing skills. Instead of checking compliance, it's about enabling improvement. And instead of being back office workers, they need to walk the floor, go to Gemba, we say in Lean. They are out there on the floor talking to the people. What about leaders? Agile leadership for the future of work is something that we are going to touch as well. Um, so instead of managing performance, we, we don't talk about performance management. We talk about performance development in the future work because that's what it is. Nobody wants to be managed, but everybody wants a coach, you know, who helps them to develop and grow. Uh, so this is a case of micromanagement. Instead, we need the, uh, to enable performance in the organization and enable um, development. So the CEO becomes a chief enabling officer instead of uh, a chief executive officer. And um, managers need to build psychological safety. That's one of their most important tasks. So how do you create an environment where people are free, feel free to speak up and admit errors and mistakes so that everyone can learn from them? Well, you as a manager need to show vulnerability. You need to go first. As a leader, you need to show that you don't have all the answers. You are not perfect. We can't know what will happen and we need everybody's brain to try to figure out the best way forward. This is a, a statement that, that uh, the future leader could, could say. Uh, what do you think? We need everyone's brains here to solve the problem. So showing that I am part of the team, I don't have all the answers, I have some ideas, but we need to think and work together to solve the problems. And the Gardner metaphor is the best metaphor for agile leadership, where we see the company as a garden. And there is an overall purpose with the garden. And all the plants are there to um, together fulfill that purpose. So um, regardless, uh, the, the, the garden needs to be taken care of to fulfill its purpose. And the plants need to be taken care of, and they have very different needs, as you know. Um, it's only the gardener who exactly knows how to treat every plant in a different way. And it could be that uh, one plant need, need more or less water or sunshine or a special soil or like to, to grow together with other plants, or maybe they like to, to grow you know, f faster or slower. It's, it's very, very different depending on what kind of plant it is. It's the same with people. We are very different as well. And we need care and, and um, there needs to be somebody who, who understand us and can help us to develop and grow. So um, 
if we look at the difference between the manager and the agile people coach, uh, the 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 manager may have no or low competence in lean and agile ways of working, and the agile people coach needs deep con competence in this area. We move from deep sk skills in some specialist area to deep people skills as well. We talk about people managers here, nothing else. And instead of being process driven, uh, we need to be people and purpose driven. And instead of having a fixed mindset, they need a growth mindset. Instead of con command, and, command and control saying, I decide, they need empowerment and alignment and say, I facilitate. Focusing heavily on numbers, forget about that. Instead, focus on the people who will then deliver the numbers. Instead of artificial harmony, we talk about healthy conflict in a balanced, good way. And instead of telling what to do, we storytell to inspire action. Instead of judging employees in different kinds of ratings, we coach employees to perform. And inst instead of local optimization, we work with global optimization. We look at the whole system, the whole garden. Uh, instead of deciding career paths, we mentor growth. And instead of carrots and sticks, we uh, use dialogues about intrinsic motivation to make people, to, to inspire people to go with us in a, a common direction. And still, instead of decision delay, we need faster decentralized decision making by empowering the people. And instead of speaking and proposing, leaders need to frame, probe, and listen much, much more. This is the Agile People Coach. And the basics of uh, this framework is built on Lisa Atkins' framework for Agile coaching. Uh, but we also added uh, more roles to this picture. And the guide and navigator. It sounds like a baby in the background. Very cute sounds. <laughs> Uh, so to, to take the role of an Agile people coach, you can come from being a leader, maybe you're an Agile coach, a master of Agile, or you're an HR professional. And I, I didn't describe these roles because this is something you bring with you when you become an Agile people coach. And then you have the, the normal common coach roles, the trainer, mentor, coach, and facilitator that you may already be familiar with. And then we have the guide who has the local expertise. It could be a, a former functional manager who has very good knowledge about a certain part of the business. Maybe they come from a legal role, a marketing role. Maybe they come from uh, IT. Maybe they come from uh, whatever um, uh, business domain and maybe they have a lot of uh, competence around a certain product or something like that and then we have the navigator who is um, somebody who understands the organization as a system and the best metaf metaphor for the navigator is obviously uh, the boat the ship and the sea and um, the navigator's best friend and tool is the compass because the compass will show the direction rather than the exact path you know there there may you may have a map but if there is a roadblock on on the road uh, the map will not maybe show that and then you need the compass instead to know how to move around that but still keep moving in the in the right direction so this person is a change catalyst uh, it will apply competence and knowledge about systems thinking and about emergent strategy and how to navigate uh, tough waters uh, to avoid uh, hurting the ship or, you know, some catastrophe. And they can also see what weather is going to come and, and they, they can make predictions about, okay, let's, let's move in this direction instead for some time. And the reflective observer is the last role here. And the reflective observer is, is a role that all you should be able to move out in when you don't know what role to take. So you put yourself uh, outside of the whole organizational system for a while in a neutral, non-judging position 
where, where you can then reflect around what role am I needed in when I step into the system again. So um, this is a, a very important role to be able to play always uh, when, when you need to decide how you best can serve your organization. And this role is, is a very, very um, senior role, I would say. It, it's not a role that you can take when you're 20 years old or 25 years old. You have to have been around. You have to have had different positions, worked in different industries, maybe had your own organization, maybe failed a couple of times, maybe raised a family and children, maybe you know learned from mistakes, uh, maybe you were fired, maybe a lot of things has happened in your life when, when you are able to take this kind of position. I, I think it's a very senior role. So if we look at the roles where the Agile People Coach could come from, so we have this leader role that can emerge from any department within the organization and has deep leadership skills. And uh, I will just go quickly now because I wanted to, to finalize to have some discussion as well. You can also come from the Agile master role uh, and you contribute with the Agile Lean tools and methods and practices, have deep experience in, in using Agile. The HR uh, professional role is another role you can come from. Maybe you have experience uh, from being an HR business partner or an HR manager or an HR professional or specialist. Um, and they have a solid general understanding uh, and knows how to deal with negotiations with unions, have competence around labor law and societal regulations and that kind of competence. The guide has deep knowledge about a specific place that you, you are in right now or about the specific topic that you are working with and can take you on a journey to understand the process. Um, agile organizations are very often dealing with situations and challenges that are complex. And then we are trying to, to look for the easy way out. But when, when you are in a complex situation and you have a wicked problem, the right strategy is instead to experiment, to probe sense response. And the navigator is someone who is comfortable with complexity and helps the team to step into the explorer mentality. Um, then we have the reflective observer. In, in, he's in, he or she is in, in the space in the middle of things where rather than jumping to conclusion or reacting too quickly and possibly wrongly, you can figure out what's going on with the team and how you can best help them in whatever scenario they are in. Mm -hmm. So depending on the needs of your people, you can take on different roles to support them. Um, nobody can be fantastic in all these roles from the beginning, of course. Um, and this is where your lifelong journey starts. You always work on improving yourself and being able to, to play more in different roles. But you start somewhere. And maybe you start from being a leader or a nature professional in your organization for many years. Uh, so, so this is a common starting point. We cannot do it alone. Leaders cannot do it alone, HR cannot do it alone. To be able to remove the limiting structures, change the culture and start collaborating towards a more agile future, we need to join forces. So we need everybody to start talking across boundaries of different kinds, to start the conversation, nudge the system and the people and move in a new common direction together. And when we work with Agile, we don't follow any recipes. We know that there are no recipes or best solutions that always work. We do know that when we stick to certain principles rather than rules, it tends to work well. Uh, best practice, as, as we have followed before, is uh, today always past practice. And only the mediocre companies will follow best practice because you will never be better than your competitors if you follow best practice. 
So we tend to stick to the principles because they are stretchable and you can choose to what degree you try to apply them in the organization. Um, how to grow culture, how to change the system? Well, I have a three-step um, small recipe for you here. So having said that there are no recipes, here is one very high level recipe. We start by changing and removing these limiting structures, the budgets, the annual performance targets linked to, to rewards and bonuses, uh, approval workflows, etc. We need to unlearn uh, a lot of things and we need to, to experiment and try to remove uh, too many processes and systems that we don't need anymore. We think we need them, but and then we, we, when we remove them, we, we don't miss them anymore. That's what happens. Um, in, and then we need to increase supporting structures uh, to make it easy to behave according to the agile mindset. And then you can use the, the tools, the agile tools like Scrum and, and Kanban boards and other OKRs, you know, this kind of of tools, value stream mapping, or um, uh, more agile uh, structures. And when we do that, we will um, we'll start showing the new behaviors that come from learning new ways of acting and working. And then we repeat from one again. So that's how we can initiate uh, a change in the system. But we need to unlearn and relearn rather than stick to the old ways. And this is the Agile People Manifesto that we created in 2019. That was still when people could meet physically during four intensive days uh, in my summer house. Uh, we gathered there on the west coast of Sweden and this is the result and this is our gift to you. And with this, I'm just going to give a last shout out here. Um, start today, follow the principles and start your personal and organizational learning journey towards greater people and business agility. The sooner you start, the sooner you will reap the benefits from happy performing people working together towards a common vision. So we invite you to join the Agile People community and you can visit agilepeople.com for more information. Thank you very much. So, thank you, hi Pia. There. Thank you, Pia Maria. Um, please, if someone has some question, open your microphone and, yeah. and feel free to, to ask. You can also put a question in, in the chat. In the chat, yes, of course. It's possible. So there is some something in the chat. It's Sylvia and some other people. Yeah, but there, there are some people who are process and tools. Yeah. People over processes and tools. Individuals in interactions over processes and tools, tools. You know, Pedro, you have a question from Bolivia. Yeah, uh, uh, first, uh, I want to say thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I think I, I've opened my mind now because I work for a human resource department and um, I was trying to find how uh, uh, can I um, um, carry the things with the people, uh, technical people. And um, I find uh, in the presentation that uh, uh, he, um, the, the human uh, agile version is it's wide, it's, uh, it's bigger, and uh, I, I like it. I, I like it so much. And I want uh, your. Um, I, I want to ask you, how can we? Um, how tools uh, do we need to, uh, as a human resource department, uh, help the uh, agile movement in an enterprise? Uh, for example, how can we uh, improve the uh, um, the um, the organizational climate? Uh, how can we uh, improve uh, 
and motivate people from this department. Mm -hmm. I think you have a lot of power in, uh, in HR. Uh, so what I would suggest to inspire other people, a very good thing to start doing is to start with yourself. So you need to start experimenting with um, practices, tools, um, and when you do that, you will increase principles and values. And other people will see this, right? So they will see, oh, HR is working with a Kanban board. Wow, they are visualizing their work. Oh, HR is working in a team now, uh, but you didn't do that before, obviously. Uh, so then you were in different specialist areas, probably. But now you work as a team and you work together. So this is a kind of a change that other people will notice. And you will in start involving the business, you will start involving the people in the organization when you are working on your HR deliverables, like programs, like um, different systems, processes, etc. Involve the people. Say, what do you think about this? How, how can this serve you in a good way? What do you need from us? Treat them as your clients, as your customers, and involve them in the work and try to do it together with them rather than trying to deliver something to, to them that you don't know if it's the right thing or not. Also, you can deliver a little bit and then you can continue and build on that and deliver a little bit more and a little bit more because that's the agile approach that you work in small sprints and build something gradually up that, and then you have a better success uh, chance um, than, than trying to deliver everything um, at the same time. Just a few small tips. I'm sure my, my Agile people friends have a lot more tips. I, I, I would specifically ask Tamara because you are working with HR in, uh, in an organization. And what are your best uh, tips to Pedro? Yeah, uh, well, thank you for asking. Um, yeah, I think what you said is actually true. The first thing you need to do is really start in changing or helping some of the colleagues, even in HR, especially if you work with COEs, uh, to really start embracing a different mindset. So first of all, you say, I really want to take part of this project. I want to take part of it. And I want to bring also some people from the business that may help giving different feedback when we are starting working on certain processes that could be performance management or a new, uh, I don't know, promotion process or anything that is standardized in an organization. And then you start creating really small working groups and start collecting uh, quick feedback as soon as you start proposing something. A very important thing is, I think is also to show some uh, data behind that because many companies also that are driven nowadays and they want to see some of the results. So. This is the best uh, the best way to do it is to do it in a short term instead of waiting maybe the end of the year to show, I don't know, what was uh, the attrition rate versus the engagement and then it's already too late, right? So really start small, uh, small and really projects where you can uh, have a, a, an impact, even if it's only one part of the organization. So start with pilots, for example, and then those pilots will expand in different area of the org and then can be for anything even a new recruitment process a new future in your hr systems i knew so really start small and then you can show the positive you know um, uh, incremental reaction to that and then you can expand and make it to a little bit bigger project so that would be my, my advice yeah it's not a big bang approach it's no. Cannot be small things in the longer perspective will make it a big difference. Especially indeed if the mindset of the organization is still not there. So you need to help changing and change can take some time and with small win wins and then also, yeah. Mm -hmm. There is another question from Alexandra Porto. She said, she asked, how are agile and no agile companies working with the agile people coaching role? If you have some percentage and our number related with that. Sorry, I don't have that. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't, uh, 
I don't know if it's a common role yet. Um, I have seen people calling themselves agile people coaches, and then they come to me and they ask, I would like to join your training because I don't, I'm not sure what an agile people coach should be doing. <laughs> That's kind of funny <laughs> but because I invented this role uh, yeah. three years ago. Um, and, and then people start to, to call themselves agile people coaches, but, but I think it's, um, agile coaching is growing tremendously, but they usually come from IT, as you know, um, and we don't have the right people experience uh, to, to really become a good agile people coach. So um, they, they miss uh, some, some knowledge there. So I, I think that actually HR and leaders are more um, skilled to, to become good agile people coaches. You can always learn the agile tools and the, the methods and the models. It's, it's not difficult at all, but it, it, it might be more difficult to, to learn how to, to work with people uh, if you come from tech. Mm. It's a senior role, like you said, and you have to, to be able to match the, your experience in HR and in, in agile. So. Mm to give a good service. Oscar, you want, you want to yeah, know? Yeah, there is a good yeah. question. <laughs> when is the right time to do changes? Wow, yeah. I, I mean, I, I know that depends on the company and, and everything. I, I mean, that question just came in during Sylvia's presentation the other day. And, and you know, this lady from Argentina asked ask that, that question, like, how do I change compensation? Because that's one of the most probably critical pieces or components on the employee value proposition. Yeah. Um, so I would like to know your thoughts on that. I, I think that you need a high level of psychological safety when you start with that, because it's a sensitive topic and fairness is the most important thing here. So perceived fairness, as, as you know, is the most important thing when it comes to salaries. So high level of psychological safety, people trusting each other. Uh, I think you should not, it's not the first thing that you do in, in HR to change compensation strategies. We have one um, person in the Agile People Group, her name is Sarah Maximilian, and, and she has specialized after, since last year, she, she went through all my training courses and she used to be a compensation and benefits specialist before. So she totally turned after uh, attending my courses. And now she's only working with agile salary setting and agile rewards programs, et cetera. And she's really doing great work in that area. I would say I can recommend to look her up on LinkedIn. Her name is Sarah with an H. Uh, Maximilian. She's from Germany. She lives in Stockholm. Yeah. But she, she has a lot of experience from that. She's working with companies now all the time, implementing agile compensation strategies, specifically compensation strategies. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, most probably you can, uh, if I may uh, interject here, I think you can change your compensa compensation strategy as soon as is, is clear the, um, the vision of the organization and the way they want to treat people. For example, if you have a um, performance management process that is broken, because maybe you say, okay, this company wants to pay uh, for individual performance and therefore you incentivate for bonuses at the end of the year and, and this kind of uh, programming, then the compensation part is obviously linked to that. So sometimes you cannot change only one, one compensation policy without touching, okay, how do you do your performance management part, your promotion process, or how do you evaluate in the benchmark in your, your job roles and, and, uh, and profiles? So it is a little bit all linked. So I think it's very important to have a people, a clear people vision uh, before starting changing things. And most probably indeed I would go for the compensation part as a as at the end of that, because it should be the results of a different philosophy, I think. Exactly. So you start with job descriptions, you start with um, succession and career processes, performance management, etc., and then you move, uh, mm -hmm. you follow kind of the, the chain there. And then you come to compensation fairly quickly because mm -hmm. everything is interlinked and intertwined. Yeah. 
Um, many organizations have command and control pyramid structures. Can you still work with Agile? You can, um, you won't get far. You can work with Agile in the team only. Yeah, in the team, but not further. And there will be um, structures that will affect the team in a different direction when, when you have these command and control and hierarchical um, structures. So it's difficult, I have done it. And we were affected uh, as a small team in a big organization. We were very much affected by the structures of the larger system, but we were kind of doing what we could do because we wanted anyway to work with Agile there. Um, thank you, George, for, for Sarah's uh, LinkedIn there. So to, um, first off, thank you so much. Um, Oscar invited me. My name is Kathy. I'm here from the US and I'm sorry, I'm reading your book. Um, I'm halfway through. It's really good. And what I was thinking, you know, when you talk a lot about the psychological safety, I come from a corporate setup, right? So when we think about agile, there's always a fear of retaliation if I go around my superior. Mm. And so um, sometimes that's a struggle, which is what I was talking about, you know, is, 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 is really trying to get the organizations to think different. It's a big, it's kind of the chicken and the egg kind of thing. Mm, yeah. So, so uh, yeah. And, and as I said before, it's a catch 22 because mm -hmm. leaders will not uh, get the agile mindset just like that. They need to experience the new structures and they are the only ones who, who can decide about removing the structures. And that's not going to happen as long as they don't have the agile mindset. So it's an impossible equation. You see, it's a catch-22 problem here. Mm -hmm. And that's why it will not happen. And the, all, the, all the competences and, and the, the skills that they were using to, to get where they are today, maybe they have a great salary, they have a great position, they have a lot of power. Finally, they can take it a little bit easy and let other people work for them, you know? And they have struggled, they have worked hard maybe for 20, 30 years to get to where they are. Why should they just give up that position for some stupid initiative called Agile? They won't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> er, I, um, I assume you're familiar with Gary Hamill's book, Humanocracy. Yeah, which I think is 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 lines up very well with what you're doing. So I've read that book and I'm reading yours, and I see these cases that could come together. So I'm excited. Definitely, yeah, it's a exciting times now because I don't think organizations have any choice anymore now, especially now with the pandemic and after the pandemic, uh, that will require a totally new. Uh, management style and leadership skills and the new mindset when it comes to how do we organize, how do we attract people, how do we lead people, how do we inspire people for performance instead of, you know, commanding and controlling them to perform dangling carrots or uh, waving sticks. Uh, so it's it, it, it requires that you understand intrinsic motivation and what people want to do instead of what they need to do and then um, to make people inspire people in a common direction not because they have to but because they want to that's the secret right so it's a, a totally different way of seeing the organization and the people in it um it, it, it's the other way around you you turn everything upside down here and start from the people instead of starting from these are the structures that you need to fit into. Instead, we have the people. What can we do together? And how shall we organize ourselves to achieve great things together? That's how you need to think instead. It's not a machine, it's a social system. And that's the huge um, difference. Yeah. Mm. Um, probably la la last question that I have, I would love to know your thoughts on, um, you know, we, we, we've been talking a lot about the pandemic and, and how the future or how the now is changing, but and, and many companies and many, you know, um, futurists are still visualizing what's going to happen once the pandemic is going to start. And I don't know if there's going to be a point when, you know, again, like a shift point where free 
pre-COVID or post-COVID or whatever, and how that's going to affect the principles of the manifesto, the Agile People Manifesto and, and everything. Do you, do you think you will need to update that once all this COVID uh, thing and the pandemic is over? Or, or, or do you think it's going to still, um, you know, on, on time and, and, and everything? Yeah. Do you mean the Agile People Manifesto? Yeah. I think it will be even stronger. I, I think it will make a lot more sense than when we crafted it two years ago. Um, I, I, it, it's like a coincidence that the pandemic should come now because everything is kind of coming together and we see a much stronger force in that human direction than, than before. Uh, the pandemic and it goes hand in hand with increased digitize, digitization as well um, and and in spite of we cannot see each other we cannot you know meet physically in spite of that I think that there is a much stronger human connection now than before the pandemic and we are, we are there for each other. It's also paradoxically enough a time of polarization politically politically in many, in many ways. Uh, but I think there is a very strong force for the human um, side. And we understand that if we are going to, to fight this pandemic, we need to be there for each other and we need to do this together. And the same goes for organizations. It, if we are going to, we are all connected in this huge global web of people, organizations and, and we are depending on each other. And it's very, very clear right now um, where some winds are blowing, they are trying to uh, cut down on, on you know, trading and stuff like that between countries. But then there is another wind blowing saying, hey, we need, we need to work together. It's, the pandemic is going to affect everybody regardless. So it, it doesn't matter if we try to protect only ourselves. We need to protect, also think about the other countries and share equally the vaccine and all these things. So uh, there are different winds blowing, but I think in the end, uh, we will not go back to the world uh, that we had before the pandemic. It will be different and leadership and organizations will have to act differently. Um, and I think the human, um, that, that kind of touch that we need for organization is going to be stronger than before. Um, I, I just, that's what I believe. So the manifesto talks about all these values and I think it will be stronger. I don't know what you think. Thank but you. Yeah, it's, uh, we have different beliefs and, um, but, but I'm quite convinced. Yeah. Hey, if we, if we don't have a question, uh, yes, some people yes. is asking. Have... Ah, Philip, Philip, okay. The sorry, last sorry. Uh, last yeah. question, Qu a quick one. Please, uh, congratulations for your presentation. Um, just one uh, quick question. I, I want to know in this uh, pandemic area, um, what, which, what is your advice to, to work this or, or to spread this uh, kind of philosophy um, to, a, uh, to a small organization that is all is working a, in a home office way right now? So I want to know uh, your, your thoughts about uh, how to, to 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 spread this this kind of agile people uh, philosophy, uh, I I think I, I need to to work uh, first uh, with the leader of the company or, or or spread to the whole company. What do you think about it, please? Yeah, but I mean it's always a good thing to have uh, the leaders with you. Obviously, awareness is always the first step. Awareness about what's happening in the world and. What, what do we need to change uh, as a result from what's happening in the world? And then um, it, it's about training. It's about understanding new ways of working. Unlearning and relearning uh, is the second step. So you need to unlearn the old ways of, of managing the old governance structures, the annual budgets, et cetera. And you need to relearn. And, and look at how do we do it differently. And this is the difficult step too. You need to practice a lot to, do, to be able to do that. It, it, it 
could start in any part of the organization, but it's very wise to involve everybody from the beginning. So if you start with top management, they become aware, then they should start involving everybody in this initiative and start the dialogues because the change always starts in, in intrinsically inside people. So you need to start the, the dialogues, the discussions about this uh, so that you start talking about it. How can we do instead making small experiments, trial and error, you know, um, failing, learning from failure, and then you move on. Okay, this didn't work, but what did we learn? Yeah, we learned a lot. Okay, great. Then we can take the next step and then we can make a new experiment and see. So this way of, instead of thinking that you know about how the future will look like, you start experimenting in the whole organization. And the more experiments you do, the more you will learn and the better and faster you will move in the right direction. I think this, this is an opportunity. I have seen organizations who have said to their people, um, you know, they have centralized, they have said, we don't know what will happen now, we do nothing. And this is the worst thing you can do is to wait and do nothing because the, the, the organizations that say, okay, what are the new products and services now that we need to develop because uh, the world is changing and we might need to deliver in a different way or, or we might, might need to change the services in, in certain ways or maybe there are some other products that we didn't think about before that we can, you know, use the people, use your collective intelligence that you have there instead of centralizing power and saying everybody's still now in the boat until this pandemic is over. That's the worst you can do is to do nothing now just action, do something. You will be the winners when you go now and, and do small experiments, find new ways of working and new products and services. And then you will fly out of the pandemic instead of being the victim of it. So the future belongs to the companies who sees this um, and who can take advantage of, of, of the situation instead of being a victim. Mm -hmm. Hey, thanks. Okay, Pia Maria, can, can you share your LinkedIn profile to mm -hmm. people who want to connect with you? Sure. They yeah. are in asking it. Definitely. Just going to go there. Ooh, okay. See what do I have? <laughs> LinkedIn. Oh, here it is. Yeah. There. Please. Great. I can do anything for you or uh, any of my partners who are uh, also here today, some of you. Thank you for joining me here. I feel very good when I see you. <laughs> so nice. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Pia Maria. Uh, just to let you know, uh, this session is being recorded and then we will share it by the website from the festival and also from my people, so you can spread it with the rest of the community, colleagues and friends to, to share these experiences and knowledge that Pia Maria uh, had the generosity to share with us today. So thanks a lot to all of you who can could connect today and especially to you Pia Maria for this hour. Thank you, George, for inviting me. Great. It was Thank you, Bia. Thank you so much. Take care See now, you. all of you. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.